I'm Mary Gallagher. I'm the president of this fine institution, Los Angeles City College, and I'm pleased to be here this afternoon, and I'm thrilled that so many of you came to see our esteemed guest today. We're really thrilled that uh, Ms. Gloria Steinem and Ms. Samantha ramirez Herrera are here today to participate in a conversation on DACA. So it's going to be fairly relaxed. Uh, we'll just talk a little bit about what this whole program means and the impact that it has on our community. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Ms. Gloria Steinem. She's a writer, lecturer, editor, feminist, activist, and leading media spokeswoman on issues of equality. In 1972, she co-founded Ms. Magazine and remained one of its editors for 15 years. Previously, she helped to found New York Magazine, where she was a political columnist and wrote feature articles. Ms. Steinem's books include the bestsellers, Revolution from Within, A Book of Self-Esteem, Outrageous Acts and Everyday Rebellions, Moving Beyond Words, and Marilyn Norma Jean on the Life of Marilyn Monroe. Now let me tell you a little bit about Samantha Ramirez Herrera. She is the CEO and founder of OffTheRecord.com, a creative content agency and digital magazine run by people of color with a focus on uplifting marginalized voices. She is also the founder of Kick-Ass Girl Pow Wow, a digital platform that celebrates and highlights girls and women who live out loud. Moreover, Rodalia Serrera is an expert in multicultural communication for Latin and Hispanic audiences and recently launched a Hispanic-inspired version of Off the Record called Mass OTR, which celebrates Hispanic creatives and communities but also focuses on relevant social issues. Please join me in welcoming them to LA. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thank you for um, having us here, and thank you so much for having this conversation. This conversation is so important right now, and I'm really uh, grateful for Gloria to be here and to you know, be an ally, because she's done so much amazing work, and I'm just very grateful that you're here, Gloria. Well, and I should say that we work together long distance. Samantha makes great films for the Ms. Foundation for Women. So I know what a great... <laughs> what a great filmmaker she is, and also that I'm so happy to be on this campus because a city college like this, community colleges, are where I love to come speak the most. I mean, this is so much more interesting than Harvard and Yale. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you look like, you know, we kind of look more or less like the country, right? <laughs> We're, 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 we're not all uh, same age, young, knowing nothing together, you know, we can, <laughs> we can instruct each other. So I'm totally happy to be here. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm a dreamer. I, um, I'm going to share a little bit about my story and um, hopefully um, you know, we can ask some of you about your stories if you guys are willing to open up so that the allies that are here, the people that are here that are not aware of how DACA has changed our, or well, how it changed our lives and how our lives are going through this like whiplash right now can maybe understand and get a little bit, a little glimpse into like what we're going through and what our communities are going through. And um, I also just want to say thank you so much for these brave dreamers here that are also here that are just like some kick ass like humans. I had lunch with them and I'm just like in love with them now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I came to America when I was six years old with my family from Mexico City. And um, you know, coming to America was a different experience. Uh, my parents, like all of our parents um, that of immigrants, of dreamers, all of our parents knew that you know, they wanted to give us a better life. They, you know, they wanted us to be those children of promise that would you know, make their sacrifice worth it. So coming here to America, I grew up and 
I didn't realize that I wasn't necessarily American. Like, I mean, I knew my heritage, I knew my culture, I knew that there was something off, but it's the, you know, the whole like concept of being a documented didn't really hit me until high school when I realized that I was undocumented and I'm one of the older dreamers, so, you know, <laughs> like, I'm one of the older dreamers, so when I was in high school and uh, coming out of high school, there was no DACA in place. And during that time, it was really heartbreaking. I was working at a pizza, at a pizza hut, with a fake ID, <laughs> you know, like, I was 14, I had a fake ID not to go out to clubs, but to work. I was, um, you know, I was, like, terrified at the thought of, hey, I'm about to leave college and, I mean, I'm about to leave high school and I'm not going to be able to go to college. I'm not going to be able to go to college because my parents don't have money to send me to college and there's no financial aid for people like me and there's no scholarships for people like me. So that was the time that was very devastating. I have two sisters who were also going through that same uh, depression and they actually attempted to commit suicide because of the stress of being a documented in this country. I took the initiative to say, I'm going to, you know, like, I know that this is hard and I would keep journals where I would write, I'm going to come out of this, I know that I'm made for a purpose. And during that time, I felt like I was not seen. Like I had to live in the shadows, like I was invisible, like many of us have felt. And I knew that it was my job to be a leader for my family. And I decided that I would learn as much as I could after I wasn't working, after I worked my labor jobs. I would, you know, teach myself how to make videos on YouTube, read everything that I found, articles about media, like just reading all the time and just telling stories and imagining in my mind all the time all the things that I wanted to be. When DACA came into place, it was a life-changing transformational time. When DACA came into place, it gave so many of us the ability to actually go get a driver's license. You don't understand what it means to have a driver's license when you have been undocumented your whole life. When you can go out with your friends and get a drink without having to pull up some kind of foreign uh, ID or a foreign passport and them asking you like, what is that? Like, why do you have that? It's, it's the little things that changed. Being able to get a driver's license and drive and not have to look <clears throat> in your rear view mirror and see and be afraid if the police is behind you. Being able to have a social security number where now instead of having to find a living place through Craigslist that you know, may not be the best place to live, now you can actually get a home in your name. Being able to actually apply for the jobs that you want. I personally took the entrepreneur route because I was already older and I didn't think that I wanted to go to college. And I've been blessed to actually partner with an advertising agency who believed in my dream and have been great partners and have helped me become a better entrepreneur. So for me right now, it's important to actually stress the fact that our communities, our dreamers are <coughs> under attack. And they are going under, they are under extreme stress they are going through so much right now. And I was telling them earlier during lunch, I was like, I am so fucking proud of us. Because we get up every morning, and we show up to our jobs. And we show up to our schools. And I show up to my office where I pay staff. I'm a job creator. And I show up to be a mother. And I show up to be a daughter. And I show up to speak for us. And I'm so proud of these streamers just got back from Washington, D.C. They were out there fighting the good fight, speaking up. We are living in extreme danger right now. For us to share our stories is dangerous. For us to show our faces is dangerous. But we are here because we believe in the dreams that our parents had for us. And we believe that if we continue pushing forward, we will win. And if it's not us, it's our next generation. Mm -hmm. It's my son. It's the next generation of dreamers that are out there. So that's my story. <laughs> I don't want to cry. Well, Samantha's story and the story of the three dreamers here is why we're here. That is the whole point, right? And I wonder if there are any other dreamers in the audience or people who are uh, 
you know, in classes with dreamers, or what, because it is these personal stories that tell us the truth about the idiocy of, <laughs> of opposing this piece of legislation. But I, I would also just like to remind us that it is very new in human history that we have had borders. I mean, you know, the, the uh, globe was covered with migratory paths like lace for most of human history. It is very new that we have had passports, that we have, how many, if we just think about our own families and where our families came from. I mean, my great-grandfather arrived lashed to the mast of a ship on the coast of New Jersey. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can, there was no legal barrier you know, it was uh, any, anybody who could get here even after there were borders. Now, we have gone through in the history of the short history of this young nation, we have gone through enormous periods of racism when it comes to immigration. I mean, even, even in my life, uh, working, say, with Cesar Chavez and the, the migrant workers here, there were a whole group of Filipino migrant workers who had come here, been brought here only as migrant workers, were unable to uh, bring their wives or families with them, had to have uh, a, uh, an old people's home which Cesar Chavez you know, managed for them because they were not allowed to have families. Think about the Asian, especially Japanese uh, and Chinese workers who built the railway uh, the, the transcontinental railway and build it with their hands and were not allowed to ride it back because of the racism. You know, this, it, it's an opportunity to think about the, uh, the newness of any boundaries, about the racist ways in which, and ethnically biased ways, and gender biased ways too, uh, because men were imported as workers, not allowed to, uh, women were not allowed to come, so you know that's how the Filipino men ended up isolated. It's, it's an opportunity to think about the, the idiocy <laughs> of, the, of, of, of borders in the first place and the profoundly racist and self-defeating ways that they have been used in the past, and finally get at least one thing right, all right? The, the dreamers are the people who are the best American citizens. They uh, have a low rare, an infinitesimal rate of arrest like for traffic. I mean, they're so much more law-abiding than the rest of us. You have no idea. And they are so much better educated than the average American. These are the people who epitomize the best that's in this country. So I think we need to figure out what we can address. Each of us has a different political representative and what the position of that uh, man or woman is and how we can pressure that person. And those are all the electoral ways, all the lobbying ways, all the ways you can talk to your neighbors and generate pressure. I mean, we're in a time of maximum citizen activism, don't you think? I've never seen anything like it, and we need to direct all of our energies to, toward uh, getting the, the dreamers secure, absolutely secure. Um, and, you know, we, we need to think what we will do if the guy in the White House who does not deserve to be an American, um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's not even a successful businessman. <clears throat> you know, that some, the, uh, <laughs> an economic writer in New York figured out that if he had just invested the money he inherited, he'd be richer than now. He's a failure as a businessman. Uh, he's gone bankrupt many times. He doesn't know fact from fiction because as countless psychiatrists have pointed out, he is, has a narcissistic personality disorder. So you can completely predict 
that he will slavishly follow any praise and respond with enormous hostility to any criticism. He actually doesn't know fact from fiction. Right? So <laughs> we need to pressure and lobby everyone around him. And I think we also can consider what we might do in the extremely, I think, unlikely circumstance that um, this doesn't work. I mean, me personally, you know, I have room in my ap apartment in New York. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we, you know, pe people can live with that. Our homes are our domain, right? We're not letting anybody in to take our guests. I mean, we can not let anybody, I'm just saying, I'm not committing this campus, but we could not let anybody on campus to take, <laughs> to take students. I mean, we, I just think we each need to make a personal commitment, and this is it. I mean, no more, no more. I think one important thing to mention while we're here is, um, since we're at a college, is I've been receiving a lot of emails recently, uh, recently from Odessa, Texas, which is a very conservative uh, place in Texas, where the, uh, someone from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce told me that uh, the students in the high schools are really afraid right now and their grades are dropping because many of them are afraid that their parents are going to be deported that they are going to be deported or that they may not have the opportunity to actually go to college or they're thinking that maybe they shouldn't enroll in college. So we're seeing that more and more around uh, the country with uh, young people who feel that their dreams are at stake right now. And I know that maybe here at the college, I don't know if there's any um, other dreamers. I like to call us doers because honestly, like we're not dreaming, we're out here doing stuff. <laughs> like we are getting shit done. <laughs> So, and I actually like apologize for calling you guys dreamers because I'm so tired of people like that dreamer, that dreamer, like they have names, Manuel, Cynthia, Melody, <laughs> I'm sorry, we just met at lunch, y'all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Carolina, like, you know, we have names. I'm mm -hmm. Sam, like we're not dreamers, we're out here doing things mm -hmm. and we need to continue inspiring the, you know, like I don't know if you guys have friends that are doers, dreamers, you know? Um, you know, check in on them right now during these times. Inspire them to continue showing up to school. Inspire them to continue showing up to life. Inspire them to continue hoping and pushing because even if they take something away from us, they can take away our learning, our skills, our motivation. We can't allow that to happen. We have to keep pushing forward and we will continue blooming. So, you know, I... I don't know what uh, the exact number of dreamers that you guys have enrolled here in this college is, but you know, checking in on them. And if you are in the audience and you've been thinking like, maybe I shouldn't go to school, I don't know if I should, like keep going, keep going because we are all out here fighting. We are hoping that legislation gets passed soon, but we have to keep showing up to life. We have to mm. keep holding our heads up high and we have to continue inspiring our fellow uh, uh, brothers and sisters, not just like from DACA, you know, other immigrants are going through it too, TPS. You know, Salvadorans are so much more than MS-13. I just have to say that here today. They are so much more than that. Mm -hmm. So make sure that, you know, we are checking in on them and that we're telling them to keep showing up. My message is that we keep showing up. We show up with our heads high and that we keep building ourselves because nobody can bring us down if we build ourselves up. And for, I have to say that for all discriminated against minorities over time or any discriminated against group, education has always been the single most important and portable thing, right? Nobody can take your knowledge away from you, right? So we have to get that message across. Right? Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or if you guys want to say anything that you feel is important to be said right now. Oh. Our Haitian community has also been under attack 
um, by our president. You know, he said their country basically was a shithole, and I don't think he's ever been there or knows anything about it. <laughs> I was wondering, do you partner with other immigrant groups in your activism? Yes, definitely. We're always out there with, um, with different groups. Immigrant fight is for every immigrant. That was my question, thank you. Mm. Or answers, we can use answers too. <laughs> <laughs> So he, the administration's making it, um, you know, contingent on the wall being funded, which we don't want either, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. none of it. So I don't know, maybe just yeah, the he comments. thinks he can build a wall across, oh, the, I know. across the Grand Canyon, excuse me. <laughs> don't work, they don't work. <laughs> so it's like to make it contingent on funding a wall for the, yeah. you know, DACA, I mean. Well, here's my plan. I, the, I'm not saying you have to do this, okay. I say, we say, okay, you know, just, you know, safeguard all the, all the dreamers, build your wall, and then when we pay our income tax, we deduct from our income tax the exact sum that would go to the wall and say, come get us. Okay, <laughs> we're not paying. I build a wall around him and keep him in there. <laughs> no, it's not impractical. You know, we used to do that in the Vietnam era. We would deduct from our income tax the 10% that went uh, to pay for Vietnam and say, come get, we never got arrested. You know, it was a way of voting. You know, we can, there, there are lots of things we can do, right. <laughs> Hi, uh, so my name is Alexandra. I'm, uh, I'm from Canada, so I'm on a student visa here. And I was wondering, what are some things that I can do here? Because I, I, I'm lucky I do have paperwork and I do have a visa, but I was here when he was elected and I couldn't do anything. I can't mm -hmm. vote, I can't, and like, what can I do beyond, like, and what can I share to my Canadian friends? You know, what, what can we help? You know, what can we do beyond sharing Facebook posts? You know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's super important, because I have so many friends that ask, like, what, what can you do? So it's something that I would be really curious on what I can help. Well, you can uh, make clear how shameful it is that you have a neighbor <laughs> that is behaving like this when the immigration policy in Canada and the ratio of immigrants per citizen is much greater in Canada than it is here. And you know, by just talking about the policies in Canada, y you can you can be helpful. And you know, by your voice, by your contributions, that's you know th that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And you know, this was also true in the Vietnam era that we were in cahoots then, so we can be in cahoots again. <laughs> Do you have any other suggestions? I think you wanted to answer this. Yeah. Um, okay. um, so, hi. hi everyone, my name is Melody and uh, I'm an organizer here. Uh, I'm an undocumented uh, immigrant. I have, I've had DACA since 2015 uh, and I lead the largest network of undocumented students, workers, and allies in California. And it's called the California True Network. Um, so we've been fighting for equality since 2003. So I know you're a special, you're in a special place, right? Because you can't vote, right? You necessarily do that. However, this year is election year, so all our attention needs to be pivoted to um, the different seats that are here in California. So in California, there are seven vulnerable seats. Uh, they're Republican districts, but they actually went to Hillary Clinton during the presidential election. So they're very vulnerable, and so we're focused on them. And just right here in Bakersfield, we have Representative Kevin McCarthy who is the House Majority Leader, um, who has a lot of power to tell Paul Ryan what to do and what to bring up to a vote. And so um, you can definitely get in touch with us. Um, we've been leading the fight at the time to defend DACA. We had a, a, a statewide caravan where we knocked on these different Republican offices. None of them opened the doors to us. Um, <laughs> and well, it's, it's actually you know a reality of our lives, right? We've been knocking on their doors for years, and they have never opened their doors, their doors to us. And so for us to make legislative change, we need people like you, like yourself, um, who can stand up for us. So you'll be considered an ally, so I know you have limitations because you can't really speak to the undocumented experience, but you have so much power that you can bring to the table. And we really need everyone's support. Like, this is not a brown issue. This is, um, this, so many different communities have DACA. The, the largest second, the second largest group to have DACA is from South Korea. Um, the, the third largest group is from the Philippines. 
Um, a lot of organizations also are taking up the fight on TPS. I know there are 10 countries who have TPS. We've heard of all the uh, Haiti, uh, Nicaragua, um, Honduras, and Salvador who are being affected. We can definitely connect you with other organizations that are specifically focused on TPS. So it really definitely is just about you bringing yourself out at this moment where, th where there's an election happening and speaking up for the voices um, of, of, of us. Because I'm honestly really tired of having to explain my humanity, constantly having to explain that I'm a human being. And um, I think if everyone really just, this, this is not just an event, right? Like this isn't just a one-time thing and I feel good by, by showing up. It actually needs to be a constant fight. I've been showing up um, since the administration took place almost 380 days now. And so it's not just a one-time thing. And we still have three years in front of us. So you know, I think it's just about us making that commitment to focus on civic engagement and to also really say, I'm going to say something. I'm going to liberate someone else because I have freedom myself. Thank you. OK. Would you not want her as a citizen, right? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to LACC. Um, my name is Carolina. I'm a counselor here at, at City. Um, former Dreamer, so I'm very, very proud of our school for doing this and putting on this event. And for all of you showing up, I see some of my students in the audience. It's really exciting that you're here and that your school is showing this commitment. Um, I also want to echo Samantha's message about students, especially if you're here at LAC, continue showing up to school. I remember this was um, probably like mm, 10 years ago, I want to say, when I was undocumented. And um, just like she shared, I'm a little bit of an older undocumented student, mm -hmm. right? We didn't have um, Dream Act, right? We didn't have DACA at that time. So it was very uncertain what was going to happen after we graduated, right? And at the time I was attending a community college um, or after I graduated from UCLA and my future was uncertain. I was working multiple jobs as a barista. I, I did so many things. Um, and somebody, um, uh, somebody who was a mentor to me spoke to me and told me, okay, but have you ever thought about what you're gonna do after you get your papers? What are you gonna do after that? What, what start, you have to start now and that, gave me the continued motivation to, to keep going, right? And that gave me the experience for after I got my paperwork to get a master's degree, to get a job at a community college, which was what I wanted to do, to pave the way for other undocumented students. And luckily, that's what I get to do today. But that's my message and that I want to echo from um, Samantha as well, is continue um, your fight. Continue showing up. I know right now it's not easy. I know I see students all the time, and um, we go through like uh, a roller coaster, right? We talk about how are you doing today, okay? But how was it yesterday, and how was New Year's? And um, it's so difficult because their lives are in the news every day, right? It's imagine being politicized like that, right? Um, really, it's like you're a bargaining chip, right? So. Um, Seeing that, um, and ha you know, I, I think about my students, right? I think about all of you. And I just want to um, really relay that message that just like there was hope for us, right, um, to continue, right? For those of us who didn't have DACA back then, right? We really, you know, um, AB 540 was all we had, right? In state tuition, and we were so thankful, right? Um, now we have to continue to fight, right, for what we already received, which by the way, DACA was a student-led effort. So I just wanna put that out there because mm -hmm. that's the power you as students have, right? Um, I know UCLA Ideas, um, really, really strong um, organization and they're nonprofit, right? So support your nonprofits if you have the opportunity to do so. Um, and I also wanna, you know, relay that message as well, to support your colleagues, support each other, right? This is a difficult time for so many different people, right? Not just 
Um, and we, we, we do this effort, all of us together, right? We, we're not in, a, in, in an Olympics of oppress, oppression, right? I, I remember reading that in graduate school, and mm -hmm. I can't believe we get to implement that today, right? Mm -hmm. we, have, we, we have to do that. So I just want to I just wanna let you all know um, that we're here for you. Um, your school's here for you, clearly. Um, there's nonprofit organizations that are here, like Cherla. I don't know if Melody mentioned, but... They're um, active in CHIRLA, which is um, the humane, oh man. Coalition for Humane, Coalition for humane Immigrant Rights of LA. So, uh, and by the way, they're down the street from us, so if you wanna get involved, um, I think that's a really great way to do that. We've partnered with them, we've done different events with them, and I hope we can continue to do that because that's how we continue to engage the community. So, um, I just wanna thank you all for coming. I, I don't think this is the end, but I just wanna relay my grateful, gratefulness and to Gloria and Samantha for being here. It is so exciting to have these conversations. I think so many people need to hear them. And uh, I'm gonna let the mic go now. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manuel Jimenez. Uh, I am a 20-year-old DACA recipient. Uh, I came here on behalf of Churla, um, and I myself have been a DACA recipient since 2012. Um, so what I'd like to say is, uh, um, and focus on what Melody had mentioned earlier, is civic engagement. That, that's something that's really important, and it's something that we should, again, really focus on, because, again, this year, two, it's, it's 2018. Uh, election year, we should focus and educate our faculty and staff, our allies, which are U.S. citizens, uh, to pretty much vote, go out there and vote. That's, that's, I can't emphasize that enough. Voting is going to change things um, with this, uh, like what's, what's occurring with this nation. Uh, the administration that's in control right now is a very toxic administration. And what, um, what, what this year, the outcome of this year, is only going to be determined by our commitment, our effort, and our dedication to changing um, the foundation that this nation is currently under control of. Uh, and well, on top of that, um, I'd just like to thank everyone who's here uh, and thank uh, Gloria, again, Samantha, Carolina, and Melody uh, for having, uh, like, and having me speak to you, to you all. Um, and that's pretty much it, and thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions? Or, an or answers or organizing announcements or... <laughs> <laughs> My question is for Sam, as well as the representatives of the LACC over there. Uh, as far as, I guess, becoming what you all became today, you know, what was it that helped y'all maintain that persistence, that helped y'all overcome the doubt, uh, the, the fear, you know, that's the question. Uh, for me, it was having something tell me that I couldn't become everything that I wanted to become. Having that opposition said, to me was like, it was a challenge, but I was like, try me, you know? It was just something deep inside of me that was burning, saying, I want to become the best me, and I'm not going to let anything stop me. And it was so difficult at times, so, so difficult. And there were so many times, and there will be times, that try you. But for me, it was like, I had, like, we all have our coping mechanisms. Mine are stupid sometimes. I went and got a tattoo that said, fuck fear. And, <laughs> and it was like, when I had nobody to tell me to keep going, or when my parents were afraid, and they were telling me, don't do this, don't do that, like, you're going out there, why are you moving here, why are you doing this? I had to look in the mirror and see this tattoo that said, fuck fear. So, I mean, I'm not saying you guys should do that, but <laughs> that's what helped me. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for that. That's a great question. And I think it made me really reflect on what was it that kept me going, right? And I'm, like Samantha said, it's, I, I can't say it was all pretty at all. Like, this is the outcome, right? I have the outcome right now. But um, it, it was such a process. And... I'm a counselor, so I'm going to brag about counseling. Um, counselors, you know, really were the ones that guided me, my mentors, which some of them are here today, and I'm so happy. Um, 
they guided me, you know, and I sought out. And I have to say, one of the things that I notice with a lot of our students is help-seeking mechanism, right? So a lot of times we don't seek help, right, when we need it. So work on those help-seeking mechanism because sometimes we need it. Sometimes we need some, something outside of us to, to say, hey, you might need to do this, right? And um, for me, it was that, that person that told me, what are you gonna do after? That was like, what? I was so caught up in this is what I am. I had become that, and I became so powerless, right? And when that person told me, well, well, next page, what about after? Oh, that liberated me and said, well, it's in my hands. That The power is back with me. And when the election happened, I had to invoke that same perspective. I was like, well, I'm not gonna give my power away, right? I've been working with undocumented students for years, and now, suddenly they're targeted, right? So um, I'm not, we're not gonna give our power away. So I've talked to a lot of students and said, well, we have momentum, right? Before people didn't know what DACA was. Now everybody knows what DACA <laughs> is. So we have momentum, what are we gonna do with it? So that we can reframe it and think of that as a motivation to continue. Look at all the people that are standing up with us, right? So. I'm, I'm, I tend to see the glass half full, and sometimes people, like counselors or others, have to help me see it. So seek help, right? That, that would be one of, my, um, one of my suggestions. And don't forget to you know, really reflect, take time, and self-care, that's really important too, meaning take care of yourself, and your own coping mechanisms, right? Is it yoga, is it whatever it is, <laughs> to get you grounded again and to help you see you know, ground you back from feeling uh, powerless and all that. That would be my. Um, thank you for being here. I actually am a graduate student at USC, um, and I just really love that you're both here and like we have people that can speak on behalf of what's going on. Um, I'm actually a counselor in training, and I work with students, like middle school students and high school students that you mentioned that are dropping out and are in fear of like what's gonna happen to their parents who are undocumented. And we brought that up in class one day, and we were stuck. And we, we try to look up things like, how can we talk about it? Because as adults in school, or at work, I think we can use like um, self-help, like we know how to take care of ourselves, but with younger kids, I guess my question is how can we like reinstitute that sense of hope for them? Or, you know, I guess it's a big loaded question, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'd like to know any tips or how we can help them, you know, I guess live their lives, not live always in fear of what's mm -hmm. gonna happen to their parents. Um, so, um, one thing that I learned actually in graduate school is that your body can only take so much anxiety. So at one point, it cannot stand, like your body, at one point, it's gonna not withstand it. So um, that's what I would tell myself in those moments uh, of when I'm like in, you know, maybe in a little bit of a crisis. <clears throat> and I think, yeah, how are younger students dealing with that? That's a really, really good question. I mostly work with college students. Um, but relaying that hope, I think it goes a little bit to what I was speaking to just now is, um, and, and when I speak with my students, I'm very real. So I, I tell them, look, not every day you're gonna feel hopeful. So it's okay that sometimes you're not gonna feel super hopeful, you know, but the bottom line is, um, do you have some support? You know, do you have one or two people that you go to? Is it your parents? Is it your teacher? Is it who do you go to for in those moments when you really feel mm -hmm. like you can't do it on your own? Um, and um, I think this probably goes to say that we need to teach students um, better self-care strategies. Um, that's something I've learned being undocumented, I think you deal with, you juggle so much. You do like three jobs and it's normal. Everybody just does it, I feel like, right? And then you become really good at doing it and then you're like, oh, I'm, on, I'm in survivor mode like the whole time and I don't understand what my limitations are. So um, I think um, teaching that and, and maybe implementing that in the classroom, like 
um, in, in, in the pedagogy of how we teach, of taking a minute, ta learning to take a deep breath. You know, those are important things. And yes, I think that sometimes that's a privilege to be able to do that because not everybody can afford that. Um, but it is something that as educators, you know, as someone who's a counselor in training is maybe in our counseling courses, we can learn to teach, okay. you know, I don't know. Hopefully that's yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. So I just graduated from USC also as a oh. graduate student, so that's pretty cool. Um, I just graduated last year. Oh. Um, so going off of that and going through my experience um, and what helped me and going off what Carolina was saying, um, we actually offer workshops on, uh, in a, you know, like the next step after self-care um, on know your rights. So how are they able to, how are, whatever age you're at, how are you able to defend your communities? And how do you prepare uh, for, for this divisive administration and for a possible um, deportation or for a possible rape? <clears throat> so we actually created so many workshops uh, that we've been using actually since 2001 uh, when the DREAM Act was first. So that, uh, again, another thing I want to reiterate is that the DREAM Act, so for those of you who don't know, um, Dream Act, the DREAM Act right now is a legislation that would replace DACA. So <laughs> another thing that we have to say is that DACA is dead, right? Um, I know that um, there was a San Francisco injunction a few weeks ago that said that some folks are able to still renew uh, and, and, and uh, file for the DACA, which by the way, a lot of organizations are covering full costs, the $495 fee and the lawyer fees. Um, so our, our organization is covering the, the full cost. We've done almost um, 800 DACA renewals. Um, well, since, yeah. <clears throat> Just, just since September. <laughs> so we've actually done 10,000 uh, since 2012. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think also letting them know that there are resources out there. So, so basically our workshops are based off that hard work. Uh, we would love to share the workshops with you all or any yeah. other um, counselors out there or teachers that have a, a classroom. We come and do the trainings for you. Um, so it, um, the, the, the students will, def, uh, or whether you already have another just group, we teach you how to, first of all, we break you down. We really understand, we, we have workshops that get un uh, unraveling the undocumented identity. So we actually make you feel very bad at first. And that is because we want you to leave that pain and shed all that was imposed on us and the, how the award undocumented was imposed on us. So we do that first. So it's very, very emotional workshops. And then once you do that, then you're prepared to take in how to defend your community. Okay. Um, so we'll definitely love, and that, the, those workshops were created at the time where undocumented students and immigrants were undocumented and very afraid. Right now we talk about undocumented and unafraid. There was a time where it was undocumented and nothing, right? Like just undocumented and silenced. And we've come such a long way. We're, I want to emphasize that too, that we're really, really, really lucky here in California to have such inclusive laws. And I know some of us from other states cannot relate. Um, and I think we need to check that privilege as well. And to also remember that a lot of um, DACA recipients or just immigrants in general uh, do not necessarily go on to higher education. So a lot of people just go straight into work. And I think it's really, really important to acknowledge all of these differences and all of our communities as well. Um, so I'd love to, to share that over with anyone. Uh, if you want to come up to us afterwards, we okay. actually do the workshops for free. Wow. Um, we, we, we do Know Your Rights. We do Rates Rapid Response. Um, we do civic engagement. We do everything. You just ask us, and then we can um, help you activate. And I mean, and I'm using the platform here that I have as a, the organization from Los Angeles because I want to open up that door. A lot of people don't know that. And the best tool that we have right now is to educate ourselves. So I want to open that up to everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you were there for kind of the beginning of the women's revolution um, in the 70s. And uh, how does that time compare to now with the movement for DACA and immigrant rights? Mm. Well, I think, uh, you know, it's different for everybody. I don't want to answer for everybody. But I, I think the beginning was distinguished by saying, wait a minute, I'm not crazy, the system is crazy. I mean, which is a huge gift, you know, because up to that time, women had been made to feel, women, diverse women, all kinds of ways, had been made to feel literally crazy, 
if we weren't content with a second class status, a derived identity, uh, if it was even wrong that we were outside the home working at all, I see heads nodding. As, you know, so so it, it, was, uh, it was in the beginning that kind of excitement and discovery. It was clearly um, a, uh, a particular group uh, or a big group, but still kind of who were making this discovery. So uh, there were all kinds of suppositions, you know, that um, if you were a feminist, it meant you were a lesbian because you could not possibly be having a relationship with, how many people remember this? That's, okay, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you could not possibly, you know, have an equal, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, there were just all kinds of, of, of myths which are gone, and now what's the big difference is that we are the majority. We're no longer this peculiar subset of people over here who were saying, um, you know, that, I mean, you know, for, for black women, for instance, who had been a, a huge part of the civil rights movement and weren't acknowledged with inside, inside the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and still are not acknowledged properly inside the civil rights movement or the women's movement, even though black women especially have always been as a way disproportionately feminist <clears throat> to white women. Look at the last election. You mm -hmm. know. So, but I think the main difference now is that we, we are not this small group over here. We're no longer meeting in each other's living rooms. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're here in an auditorium, <laughs> right? Uh, it's, it's now a majority movement and a majority change in consciousness. That's Thank huge, you. right? So now um, we're seeing all these movements, and you've mentioned that you're seeing a lot more civic activity and a lot of participation from various groups. How can we start merging, merging some of these groups and work to work together? So for example, you had an incredible turnout for the Women's March. Um, so how can we start really working together and having mm -hmm. some of that support from for example, people that participate in that Women's March, mm -hmm. and, vice, and likewise with other, other um, active groups. Well, the Women's March has continued, as you see, you see online, and actually the marches uh, the, this year were bigger than the marches last year. I mean, actually grew. And there is a whole uh, local subset of marches, so there's the national mar you know, group that started, and then in every state, so, you know, it really, it, it is, if you, you know, you can find it online, whether it's, you know, the, the, the <laughs> identified with the march or with any of the issues you, you care about, it's really present. But I think it's up to us to look at the people around us every day and not think that it's something far away. And so the, the most effective movement is the movement which says, as in the immortal words of Flo Kennedy, do you remember Flo Kennedy? <laughs> Florence Kennedy was, anyway, she used to say, I'm for anything that's off its ass, you know. So <laughs> it's, it's when you, you get up in the morning and you don't, say, you don't say, what should I do? You're not looking for instructions for somebody else. You're saying, uh, what am I going to do today? You know, that's, what, what can I do? Because you know uniquely things that I don't know. That you, right. And you have people who trust you, and nothing replaces trust. Nothing on earth replaces trust. Who will listen to you about voting or about, you know, the status of dreamers or, you know, who are your neighbors and your friends. And it's looking to see every day. And back to the, the other question about uh, the children uh, and, you know, people who are students and so on. Uh, it, uh, traveling, I think the little kids have the because little kids feel that there's something wrong with their parents, right? There's something wrong with their families. So, the, 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 if we have contact of any kind, if we can just say your parents are 
good people, they're heroes, they're fighting for what America stands for. If we can somehow allow the kids to know that, that this is a, a point of pride, that there's nothing wrong with their families. On the contrary, there's something very right with their families. Hi, um, thank you for what you're doing and for all of your courage. I actually just wanted to offer an idea based off of your question on how to help um, children feel hope. And I completely agree, giving them information is super powerful. But I've also found um, working with kids, whether it's I work in the inner city, I've also worked in refugee encampments. And when people are experiencing trauma, it's very hard, like you said, to to let go and to experience joy, but there are a few things that really work very well. One is music, one is dance, and the other is play, which arguably you could call the umbrella for all of that. Um, and even when you don't have a lot of resources, you know, even just having like a drum circle, even if we're just going like this and creating a beat together and having people dance inside of it, it's so cathartic and it's so transformative and it really helps people let go of the negative energy and I've seen it help people come back alive. Um, same goes for dance. And then also, part of the power of that as well is that when you have kids, say in a classroom, some of them are dreamers, some of, are, some, some of them aren't, we're different races. When we're experiencing play, when we're dancing together, when we're making music together, we are experiencing shared humanity together, which is so important, and I think that it's a vital piece of, of, um, of people standing up for each other because we're able to see each other in this really natural, fundamental way. But I just wanted to bring that up as a, as a method that I hope will work for you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Carol Kozaraki. I work here at the college. I did want to let people know that on Tuesday, March 27th, um, the, some of our faculty from poli sci and from law are working with League of Women Voters to put on a civic engagement event. So this is going to be taking the, uh, you know, the entire structure of it is, is still being um, resolved, but what they're going to be doing is probably having a couple of speakers and some of the issues might be things like homelessness, um, issues related to immigration and activism. And then part of the day is going to be having community organizations come in that have either internship or volunteer opportunities for students in these types of important areas. So as we get more information out, if you're a faculty member, please encourage your students to come. Give them a little extra credit. Students, we hope you will take advantage. And I know that there are so many people here, either from these organizations or that have connections to these types of organizations. So if you kind of can let myself, um, Alan Andreasian, any of our um, senior staff know about that, we would invite them to be part of this. And again, with the idea of letting them know that there are opportunities for students to become engaged and make a difference on these kinds of really important issues. So March 27th, don't forget. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Carol Wenger, and I work at the foundation here. And a couple of months ago, um, one of our students came, um, well, she was a former student, she works here now, and she came and she said, I want to start a book award for DACA students here. And so she made, and she did it in honor of her parents, and she made this $500 gift. And um, she said, I, you know, we worked together on a flyer, and she said, I'm going to take this flyer everywhere, and I'm going to try to raise money for this book award. And so I said, go to your church, go to your friends, you know, go. And we talked about all these different places she could go. And she called me a couple weeks ago and she said, so how's my fun doing? And I said, well, we really only received $35 from a, a friend. And then we have your gift. Do you want us to allocate that money or award that money to a student? Or do you want to keep building it up? And she said, well, give me a week and I'll keep trying to build it up. And so she called me again a week later and she said, well, you know, I went to all the people I know don't have any money to donate to the book fund I set up, and they're, you know, they're miserable, they're unhappy, and they have all their challenges and what, whatnot. So what, 
I mean, I can tell. I mean, how does she go out and market her book award being part of DACA and going mm -hmm. out into the community to try to raise money to bring this well, book the award? The book up? award means she's buying books. No, it means that it mean? for students who can't afford their books, yeah. um, they can apply for her book award and possibly get awarded money to purchase their books to study. Mm -hmm. Well, we can all contribute something in this room, right? To the, I'll contribute. To, but you have to tell us how, though. Oh, you just contact me. At the okay, but you, have, but you have to tell us how. <laughs> so you call the foundation and you ask for Carol Wenger. What the LACC has its own foundation. So the purpose of the foundation not only is to raise money for the college, but we do all sorts of outreach and partnerships with different organizations, many of whom are you know, serving the underserved, if you will, and many of them are DACA. And, um, and so we, and we try to um, sort of infiltrate every area in LA and beyond to try to talk up the importance of education and um, growth and getting a job and being a, a regular part of society. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we do a lot more than fundraise, but that's our ultimate purpose. And so um, there's a foundation, it's on campus here, and it's in the Student Union Building. And if you know anyone that's interested in... Okay, it's a book fund. I wonder, I mean, textbooks are very expensive, yeah. oddly expensive, right? So I wonder if we couldn't shame the textbook companies into giving a percentage of books to dreamers. Right. So we just need somebody to, to, to call and write every textbook company and get them right. to give a, you know, a few hundred I had, books. I had that idea at one point, and, um, and uh, I, I really didn't get anywhere, but I didn't spend a did lot of time you, on that. Did you try the textbook companies? Contacting publishing companies, and yeah, absolutely. All right, um, well, let's write a mutual letter. Maybe we can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a question um, for... Yeah. For you, actually, a follow-up question to the book award question. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't catch your name. Uh, Carol, did you have um, undocumented students share how this award would help them? Like actual testimony. Yeah, I think that's another huge step. Um, mm -hmm. I know here at LACC, stories, yeah, right. we have ideas. We have the club here exclusively will, will open to undocumented students and people who are affected by this administration. So actually having them share how this award would help them, I think, I mean, you, because then whoever is donating money will see the value in them, right? We'll, we'll understand that. We haven't raised enough money, really, mm -hmm. No, and we understand that, but the, the stories can really help whoever you're asking for money to mm -hmm. understand, oh, this is going to affect Manny, yeah. right? This is going to help Manny afford his books for biology because he wants to be a doctor. So I think just incorporating mm. that human side, even for us, has been very, very helpful. Um, and you know, you can work it with the students to see who's comfortable sharing their stories um, and what part of their stories mm. they want to share. We also want to be conscious of folks' you know com comfort level. Um, but I think that'll be very, very helpful. Does, in does the foundation there. have a website? Yeah. All right, put it on the website so people know that they put the stories on the website yeah. and the need for books on the website and people it's you know it's a way that people can respond right we'll, we'll report on it in our school newspaper so we'll have okay. a story <laughs> we've run out of time I, everybody is saying here all right I, I just have one last uh, instruction which I can never resist <laughs> which is just do you know each other just before you leave Look around and see two or three people you don't know. Introduce yourselves, say what you care about, what you're doing. You know, you'll leave here with a new friend, a new subversive colleague, <laughs> or something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.